little less than one year from today, you will go into the voting booth and you will select the next president of the United States of America. I think elections are about the future. But how do you determine what will happen in the future? Well, you have to look to the record. You have to look to what we say in campaigns. Egotism, and what we have done during our and narcissism, <laughs> Islamofascism is real. Their goal is to unite the world under a single jihadist caliphate. Use fear and falsehood. My view is we had a double Guantanamo. What do you talk about when you have nothing to say? This is insane. Some of these people frighten me. They frighten me. President Bush has talked about our staying in Iraq for 50 years. Maybe 100. The danger from Iran is grave. Well, I'm not concerned about the voters. It'll be a really nice fruitcake. But I can't be president unless you choose me to be. And I hope you will. Deficit financing, big government, more taxes, more bureaucracy, more regulations, more policing the world. What are you guys talking about, you know? So many people say, Oh, Ron Paul, he's crazy. That guy's crazy. And, and it's because they don't understand. And the reason that they don't understand is because they're getting all their news from the TV. I've been called everything. I've been called crazy. I've been called... Um, when I got in a fight with the neocon guy, he said, I'm a nut job. He said, Ron Paul's a nut job. You know, I mean, Ron Paul has forgotten more about economics than this guy knows. I mean, you know, Ron Paul has forgotten more about the Constitution than this guy knows. If what's presented to them is right is absolutely wrong, how do you know any better? Do you, do you know what I mean? Um, everybody's too busy paying the bills, trying to put food on the table and support their families to be as big a political nut as I am, or some of you are, you know, to keep up with it. You're just regular working people. Listen to talk radio some, maybe watch the news. If that's your worldview, if that's your perspective, how do you know any better? There, there is no news anymore. As you know, news is gone the, in television. It's entertainment. It's all entertainment. The media are almost incapable of reporting and even understanding the Constitution and the way that the Constitution is supposed to be respected. If he can get in the debates and if he can make a statement and if he can really clearly enunciate his views, I think it's a story that deserves to be heard and I think it's a story that deserves to be told. And I was the one the most hesitant to get involved because I never, time isn't right. Young people haven't heard about this. I'm not the right guy. We need more education because I believe that uh, ideas move countries and individuals don't unless they're in the right place at the right time. The big impact was when Ron Paul started to appear in the debates. There were 11 guys on the stage and 10 of them were saying the same thing and, and Ron Paul was, was standing out. We must win in Iraq. We're going to have to engage in the Middle East. This is a global effort we're going to have to lead. We will do whatever is necessary. The Iranians could grab the Shia South. We have a new strategy. Very confrontational and very aggressive. There will be chaos that will spread to the region and to the rest of the world. They ultimately want to bring down the United States of America. Congressman Paul, you voted against the war. Why are all your fellow Republicans up here wrong? Ron Paul is not the snappiest speaker. He's not the soundbite guy. He can't just say something real quick. I believe that when we overdo our military uh, aggressiveness, what it does, it actually weakens our national defense. I mean, we stood up to the Soviets. They had 40,000 nuclear weapons. Now we're fretting day in and day night about third world countries that have no army, navy, or air force, and we're getting ready to go to war. The things that he's talking about don't have soundbite answers. You have to explore things a little deeper to understand what he's talking about. So he's trying to give you some backstory when he's giving you his answer. His style was, had rough edges, wasn't as polished. I knew a lot about that because I helped prepare a candidate, uh, Herbert Walker Bush, for the debates. I was a shill, and so we would debate ad nauseum. So every line, every question was anticipated. And I could tell that what Ron Paul was saying was uh, not for purposes of winning an election. They were gut reactions, truthful reactions to the issues. At the core, the justification for his positions, the reason that he took the positions that he did was based on individual freedom. A national tamper-proof ID card. Yeah, I think that's uh, critical. They have to have a document. A national special 
card. Absolutely. A tamper-proof card, a database, name, date, birth date, biographic <clears throat> information. Dr. Paul. I am absolutely opposed to a national ID card. This is a total contradiction of what a free society is all about. The purpose of government is to protect the secrecy and the privacy of all individuals, not the secrecy of government. We don't need a national ID card. Ron Paul is completely uninterested in telling other people what to do or being told what to do. And there are very few people like that in politics anywhere or ever. Because politics is, of course, about amassing the power in order to tell other people what to do. And Ron Paul rejects that. I support federal funding. That's a yes, uh, Dr. Paul, yes or no on federal Pro funding. Programs are like this are not authorized under the Constitution. The trouble with this... He would take even issues that most people would consider minor, but vote on principle, even if it meant he was the only one voting against or for whatever it was, usually against. Would you work to phase out the IRS? Immediately. That's <laughs> <laughs> what they call a softball. And, and you can only do that if you change our ideas about what the role of government ought to be. I was just absolutely shocked that I was listening to a man who was speaking the truth. Speaking the truth about economics, speaking the truth about foreign policy. And I just said to myself, you know, who is this guy? Where has he been? And what is he doing up on stage with all of these other, all of these other Republican candidates? He'd talk about central banking, which is off the table. I mean, no, it's not even a, an issue. No politician raises it. No presidential election has ever turned on it. It's just been quietly removed from the political conversation. He brings it back. We live way beyond our means with a foreign policy we can't afford and an entitlement system that we have encouraged. We print money for it, the value of the money goes down, and poor people pay higher prices. That is a tax. And I began to realize that this man is no joke. He is America's last true statesman, and he has actually been saying the same thing for the past 30 years about what our federal government needs to do to serve the people. That is, namely, follow the Constitution. Suddenly, a lot of people who love the country and haven't voted precisely because they feel like it would be an insult to the great history of this country to vote for you know, one or the other criminal are so excited at the prospect that, wait a minute, maybe the country can be saved after all. I think there is a market for an appetite for his ideas. And his ideas are, you know, pretty straightforward. If you sort of allow people to do what they want, they're going to make a ton of mistakes. They'll do more things right than wrong. But in either case, you don't really have a right to intervene. This was the first election where you had somebody like Paul, where you could actually see a reflection of grassroots support, you know, through the Internet. Uh, the closest thing I can think of is Howard Dean in 2004, but that, that pales in comparison to what happened to Paul, especially with young people. My name is Michael Nystrom. We are in my home here in Arlington, Massachusetts, which is a suburb of Boston, and I created and run a site called The Daily Paul. We had to become our own media. That was, that was a big part. I mean, the internet was a major driving force in spreading the word. What was so wonderful about the Ron Paul campaign is the new free press was utilized, the internet. And that was wonderful because that's the next generation. Going back to take a look at world headquarters of the Daily Paul. Here it is. Probably not what people imagine, but... <laughs> it's funny, you know, you'll hear Limbaugh and all these guys talk about, well, some blogger wrote, well, some blogger, who are you? I know you make $400 million a year, but what are your political credentials that your opinion is more important than some blogger? This is just right off the kitchen. I like to say that I work from the kitchen table. This is the power of the internet, that a guy in his kitchen can have this kind of an impact. The community of websites that was created by the Ron Paul movement um, is really quite phenomenal. It's like its own world. The Ron Paul forums in the Daily Paul became to be the two prominent user communities for the Ron Paul movement. I look at it as, as somewhat of a, a crucible, or a, it, it's a place where ideas get thrown in and there's lots of fire and sparks and then something comes of it. Me and Brian, we met at uh, a meetup group and we talked about ways that we could harness the internet. Meetup is a website where people with like interests can form social organizations, groups, and use the internet as a basic tool for the structure of their organization, where they're going to go, where they're going to meet, and it's basically their communication hub. We were, you know, explosive growth for, for a long time. The number of people in meetup groups, I know McCain, he's got like five people. Blew away every other candidate by a mile. 
4,000, 5,000, something like that, um, groups around the world. And not just in America, I mean around the world. They were in Belgium and, and Australia and, and just, they were everywhere. Well, he is one of the 10 presidential candidates to face off in tonight's debate right here on Fox. But I got to tell you, I have never seen so many viewer emails urging us to get a candidate on our air as I have with this particular gentleman. How are you going to stand out tonight? Well, I guess uh, just telling the truth like I did last time, and we did very well. In the debate, when you get uh, one minute and 30 seconds, maybe for a rebuttal, and uh, it might take you a sentence or two to really collect your thoughts, eh, it's a bit challenging. So sometimes I, after I looked at it, I said, well, I did better than I th thought I was going to be able to do. It is the constitutional position. It is the advice of the founders to follow a non-interventionist foreign policy. Stay out of entangling alliances. Be friends with countries. Negotiate and talk with them and trade with them. They looked at that Republican stage that night and they're like, what is this guy saying? We've never heard anything like this. And what's better, it makes a lot of sense. So there's a lot of merit to the advice of the founders and following the Constitution. And my argument is that we shouldn't go to war so carelessly. When we do, the wars don't end. He, he was talking more about the, the things that really matter, not the war in Iraq, but should we be the policemen of the world? Should we be at war anywhere, and why, and when, and under what circumstances? Congressman, you don't think that changed with the 9-11 attack, sir? What changed? The non-interventionist policies. No, non-intervention was a major contributing factor. Have you ever read about the reasons they attacked us? They, they attack us because we've been over there. We've been bombing Iraq for 10 years. You know, if we misbehave around the world, you know, there are going to be people in the world who don't like the United States, period, end of story. Um, I think that's just common sense. I think most kids know that at, you know, at, the, at the kindergarten level. It's very easy to be Rudy Giuliani and say, we've got to get the terrorists. Or, you know, yeah, people will vote for you for that. It's very hard to get them to vote for somebody who actually makes them think or says, wait a minute, these slogans are fit for a seven-year-old. Right now, we're building an embassy in Iraq that's bigger than the Vatican. We're building 14 permanent bases. What would we say here if China was doing this in our country or in the Gulf of Mexico? We would be objecting. We need to look at what we do from the perspective of what would happen if somebody else did it to us. I thought, what fun, how are they going to answer that? And it must have been embarrassing <laughs> for the other candidates to have to sit there and, and hear this uh, deep discussion and to know in their hearts the guy's absolutely right. But <laughs> are you suggesting we invited the 9-11 attack, sir? I'm, I'm suggesting that we listen to the people who attacked us and the reason they did it. They have already now, since that time, have killed 3,400 of our men, and I don't think it was necessary. Ron Paul had the courage and integrity to call out the established fantasy that a lot of the neocon and establishment politicians have, which is that you know, the United States, anything the United States does around the world is morally good because we, quote unquote, have the moral high ground. Why are we being attacked? Well, that, you're not allowed to ask that question. We're being attacked because we're such wonderful people. Well, why else? That's really an extraordinary statement. That's an extraordinary statement of someone who lived through the attack of September 11, that we invited the attack because we were attacking Iraq. I don't think I've ever heard that before, and I've heard some pretty absurd explanations for September 11. <laughs> I would, I would ask the congressman to withdraw that comment and tell us that he didn't really mean that. And Dr. Paul wouldn't back down. Everyone in the audience wanted him to pander and say, oh yeah, no, no, I didn't mean it like that. I meant it this way. And he took that opportunity to educate the people. Paul explained the concept of blowback to uh, an, an audience, most of whom probably did not want to hear that, or more importantly, have never heard that. Congressman? I believe very sincerely that the, that the CIA is correct when they teach and, and talk about blowback. When we went into uh, Iran in 1953 and installed the Shah, yes, there was blowback. Uh, the reaction to that was the taking of our hostages, and that persists. And Paul pointed out that the primary cause of the threat of terrorism in the United States comes almost exclusively, not even sort of in piecemeal, but almost exclusively, because